Russia has massed more than 100,000 troops near Ukraine's border, and there are mounting fears that Vladimir Putin is intent on launching a full-scale invasion and installing a puppet regime in Kiev. Videos released today did show some Russian forces allegedly withdrawing from the front. However, Western officials believe there are still more forces heading west. In a moment, our two debaters are going to make their opening speeches. Then I'll be taking your questions and encouraging some debate between the speakers. At 6.55 p.m., the speakers will end the debate with short closing statements, and then I will invite you all to make your final vote, which I will announce at 7 p.m. Do you please start sending in your questions to our speakers. You can type your question in the box at the bottom of the screen. If you don't want your name mentioned, you can click uh, anonymous button before you press send. Also, please do tweet using the hashtag IQ2. Okay, and we should shortly be getting those uh, results of the first vote. Just checking now. Just bear with us a little bit, bit longer. Okay, so we have 43% for the motion, 23% against, and 34% of you are still undecided. Right, now we're going to hear from our speakers. They're each going to have seven minutes each, and at six minutes, I'll be tapping my glass just to let them know that they've got a minute left. First of all, we have Anatole Lievin, and Anatole is the Senior Research Fellow at the Quincy Institute for Responsible Statecraft in Washington, D.C. He's the author of several books on Russia and its neighbours, including Ukraine and Russia, A Fraternal Rivalry. His latest book is Climate Change and the Nation State. Over to you, Anatole. Thank you so much, Larissa. Um, thanks to Intelligence Squared for inviting me to speak. It's also a pleasure, I may say, to um, be chaired by someone from The Times. I was correspondent for The Times in the former Soviet Union and Russia in the 1990s. Uh, so, first, to address the, uh, the actual question um, here, it talks about compromise with Russia not uh, unilateral concessions, and certainly not surrender to Russia, but a compromise with Russia's demands, in which we will also uh, derive advantages for the West. So what are Russia's demands? Uh, firstly, that NATO remove the additional troops that NATO has stationed uh, in the new members of NATO in Eastern Europe since NATO began its expansion to that region after the end of the Cold War. And secondly, that NATO abandon uh, plans for further enlargement, especially, of course, to Ukraine. Now, these are not demands by Putin. They have been the position of every Russian government uh, since NATO expansion first began or was first mooted in the 1990s. Uh, when NATO expansion first began, um, a great many Russian, leading Russian liberals warned against it, argued strongly against it, and in particular said that if Ukraine and Georgia were brought into NATO, this would lead to confrontation and possibly war with Russia. So we cannot say that this is something that Putin has sprung on us you know, for his own personal evil purposes. The second point here is that among those who warned against NATO expansion from the very beginning, and drew particular attention to the consequences if Ukraine were brought in, uh, were three former US ambassadors to Moscow, including perhaps the most famous of all, George Kennan, the architect of the containment of the Soviet Union uh, at the start of the Cold War, who described NATO expansion as the most fateful error of American policy in the entire post-Cold War era. So uh, there is tremendous support for um, the case that NATO expansion to Ukraine is a terrible idea from leading American, not just experts, but leading American former officials. The first uh, Russian demand, um, arms reduction in Eastern Europe. Now, this can be addressed through uh, a return to uh, the Intermediate uh, Range Nuclear Forces Treaty uh, and the Conventional Forces in Europe treaty. Uh, obviously, this once again will require concessions on both sides. Withdrawal of missiles by Russia, certainly, of course, withdrawal of the Russian troops who have been deployed on the borders of Ukraine, and there will have to be reciprocal concessions by the West. 
as always happened in such negotiations. Now, the Biden administration has, in fact, already announced that it is willing to negotiate along these lines. Of course, there will be a lot of hard bargaining, but clearly a compromise here is, in fact, entirely possible. Secondly, uh, NATO membership for Ukraine. Now, here, uh, a compromise has been proposed, once again by a senior former US official, Tom Graham, uh, that, for example, we could have a moratorium on NATO membership for, say, 20 years, during which period uh, we would try to sort out the wider security problems with Russia, and during which period, of course, it might well be that problems elsewhere in the world, climate change, for example, would reduce this issue to its proper minor dimensions, as far as the interests of the West are concerned. But in fact, giving up the idea of NATO membership for Ukraine completely would sacrifice nothing on the part of the West, for the simple reason that we have made it absolutely clear that there are no circumstances in which we would in fact fight to defend Ukraine. In fact, the NATO position towards Ukraine could be described as won't fight, can't fight. Uh, all the NATO members have said, have said they will not send troops to defend Ukraine. Not just that, in what I have to say, for me, was a somewhat humiliating move by the West. Uh, we are even withdrawing our diplomats from Kiev. Now, that is the measure of our real commitment to, to the defence of Ukraine. Um, and we also simply cannot defend Ukraine. The symbolic deployment uh, of NATO to, Eastern, to members of NATO in Eastern Europe uh, are really, uh, as I say, purely symbolic. Um, there are a few thousand troops. To bring Ukraine into NATO and guarantee its defence against Russia would require Cold War-style armies deployed to Ukraine. In the case of America, look at what that would mean in terms of distraction from China. In the case of most European countries, including Britain, we simply do not have the troops. There can be no British army of Ukraine. The whole British army can now mobilize two brigades. Uh, as to the notion that uh, compromise uh, with Russia over Ukraine will lead to successful Russian pressure to take Poland and other East European countries, or even the Baltic states out of NATO, this is absolutely ridiculous. Uh, the Russians know these people very well, and anyone who does know a Pole or an Estonian, know that that is simply not going to happen. These countries are categorically committed to the West. Now, since um, I, if I may try to preempt my respected opponent, um, and I've taken part in such debates before, of course, uh, the um, advocates of a hard line against Russia cannot, in fact, meet us on the grounds of facts. They appeal to general principles. Now, leaving aside the fact that it is somewhat ironic, to say the least, uh, for Britain and America to appeal to such principles, given our behaviour over the past 20 years, uh, we have seen many such disputes um, in recent decades, many of them stemming, as this one does, from the end of empire. In the end, the management of international affairs requires some form of compromise between our desire for international law and our recognition of the realities of international power. That, by the way, is the approach that Europe has taken with regard to the United States when we have disagreed with its actions. That is the approach that we have taken to the Turkish invasion of Cyprus, the Indian occupation of Kashmir, and many other examples. If we could recognize the need for compromise in these cases, there is no reason at all why we should not pursue compromise with Russia in the case of Ukraine. Thank you. Perfect. Absolutely. Seven minutes there. Uh, thank you very much. And now we're going to have Chris Miller, who's going to be speaking against the motion. Chris is a Jean Kirkpatrick visiting fellow at the American Institute, uh, Int Enterprise Institute, where he focuses on Russian affairs, Russia and Ukraine and Russian European relations. His books include We Shall Be Masters, Russian Pivots to Asia, From Peter the Great to Putin, Putinomics and Power and Money in Resurgent Russia. Thanks very much, Chris. Well, thank you, Larissa, for the introduction and thanks to Anatole for 
kicking off this discussion, I'd like to uh, begin by digging in, if we can, to the question at hand, which is, should the West compromise over Ukraine? And it seems to me this question does cut to the heart of this debate. There's not much disagreement about whether we should compromise with Russia. As Anatole said, Western leaders have already offered to compromise with Russia on an array of different issues. The question is, should we compromise with Russia at Ukraine's expense? And this is where uh, I think the matter lies. Let me first, before turning to the specifics of Ukraine, though, uh, address the general question of NATO, since it is NATO uh, that is to a certain extent at stake here, although I also want to focus on the question of Ukrainian sovereignty and independence, which Anatole didn't touch on. Anatole suggested that NATO enlargement was a fateful error, quoting George Kennan. And when I look at Europe, I don't see the evidence of that. All NATO countries that I look at, from Poland to Romania to the Baltic states into the Balkans, are more peaceful than almost anyone would have expected they'd have been at the end of the Cold War when they were released from Soviet domination. And so rather than a fateful error, it seems to me that NATO enlargement has been an extraordinary success of European and American diplomacy. No one would have predicted in 1991 when the Cold War ended that Europe could be so straightforwardly pacified with uh, with only a couple of exceptions, democratic uh, governments united whole, uh, p whole at, f at free and at peace. This is a great success story for Western diplomacy rather than a fateful error. The, the question, of course, today, though, is about NATO and Ukraine. And I think here a couple of data points are in order. The first is to say that Ukraine has no desire to be part of a Russian sphere of control or to return to the fold of the Russian Empire. Russian President Vladimir Putin has said that he sees Ukraine and Russia as one people, but the Ukrainian populace doesn't agree. Opinion poll after opinion poll, election after election, Ukrainians want to be independent. Uh, the most recent polls from the respected Kiev Institute of Sociology find 88% of Ukrainians want independence from Russia, a majority want to join NATO, and that number has been increasing over time in all regions of the country, whether Ukrainian speaking or Russian speaking, the trend line is positive. A majority of Ukrainians also say Russia is a hostile state, 72% in the latest poll, and it's not uh, hard to understand why Ukrainians think that. For the past eight years, uh, Ukraine has faced uh, a set of types of pressure from Russia, economic pressure, diplomatic pressure, cyber attacks, and of course, most importantly, military pressure via the Russian occupation of Ukraine's Crimea and the regular fighting that is taking place in the Donbass, which is occupied by Russian-backed, armed, and funded militias. If you listen to the Kremlin talk about the current crisis, a crisis that emerged because Russia decided to put over 100,000 troops on uh, its border with Ukraine, Russia describes the question of one of security guarantees. And the irony is that Russia thinks that it's the country that needs security guarantees. Russia, a country with one of the world's two largest nuclear arsenals, Russia, which has one of the world's three most powerful conventional militaries, thinks that it uh, is a country that needs security guarantees. Whereas when I look at European security, the country most at risk to me seems to be Ukraine, not Russia. And so the security guarantees that the Kremlin are looking for seem to be not really uh, based in fact, but based in something very different. Now, for the past uh, decade or so, the Kremlin has focused on uh, trying to bring Ukraine back into its orbit. There are lots of people who regret the collapse of the Soviet Union, lots of people in Moscow who think that reinvigorating Russian imperial control over Eastern Europe would be a good thing for Russia. And they've had some successes uh, in recent years, but they've had some failures too, which is that the Ukrainians, as well as other people on their border, don't want to join them. And so Russia's had to find ways, new stories to invent, uh, to justify its increasingly aggressive policies to these countries. You don't grab your neighbor's territory uh, as a way of achieving security against them. Uh, yet that is, that's exactly what Russia has done. The reality is that what we're talking about here is not primarily Russia's security. If you had as many nuclear missiles as Russia does, missiles that are launched from planes, that are uh, launched from ICBMs on uh, spread across Russia's territory from submarines that are impervious to Russian, to, to, I'm sorry, to NATO attack, you wouldn't feel insecure. And I think it's implausible that uh, the Kremlin seriously feels threatened by NATO forces, which anyway are only a tiny fraction of what they were 
during the peak of the Cold War. It's Russia, not the United States or NATO, that's been building up its military forces in Europe. Since 2008, Russia's launched an extraordinary military modernization that's been very successful, as we've seen on battlefields like in Syria. It's Russia that's rolled out a set of new hypersonic missiles that has the most advanced hypersonic missile program of any country in the world. And so when I hear Russians talking about insecurity, I struggle to understand what reality this is based on. Every military analyst that looks at the military balance thinks that it's shifted substantially in Russia's favor over the past couple of years. I think Anatole exaggerates when he says that NATO would struggle to defend borders in Eastern Europe, but there's a grain of truth there, which is that Russia is substantially stronger today in pure military terms than it was a decade ago, which again makes Russia's demands for security seem even more puzzling to me. In fact, I think when Russia talks about security, what it really means is sovereignty. It doesn't like the fact that Ukraine wants to be an independent country. Last summer in June, President Putin published a very high profile article still published uh, on the Kremlin's website, which argued that, quote, you Ukraine can only have true sovereignty in partnership with Russia. That's what this is about. Should Ukraine be sovereign or should it be a second tier state answering to the Kremlin's whim? And so when I think about compromising with Russia in the current crisis, I say, yes, absolutely. Let's find ways to compromise with Russia in the ways that Western leaders have already proposed. But if it comes to compromising Ukraine's sovereignty, I say no, Ukraine's sovereignty doesn't threaten Russia. Russia's military is stronger than it's been in the past 30 years. And when Russia talks about security, what it means is domination. That's something we simply should not accept. Brilliant. Thank you very much. And just a reminder to those in the audience to uh, submit some of your questions. I just want to, to, to kick us off here. Um, I'm, I'm just wondering what both of your thoughts are on the uh, rhetoric that's come from the uh, West and obviously from Ukraine, it's been quite different uh, from, from the Ukrainian perspective. They've obviously wanted to play down the crisis, whereas the, the West has obviously been accused of being quite hysterical. Uh, and that's obviously a, a comment by uh, the, the Russians. And I, I'm just wondering what you what you both make of that. And and, and do you think, is, is, it, is it ever too late for uh, diplomacy? So both of those, those points, please. Uh, Anatole, do you want to kick us off? Well, I think it's obviously not uh, too late for diplomacy because both sides have said that they are engaging in diplomacy. R Russia, by the way, has repeatedly denied that it intends uh, to invade Ukraine. Uh, it could be indeed that this whole you know, Russian exercise is a form of giant bluff, really, and that they don't intend to invade at all. Of course, the threat does remain. Uh, but um, it certainly does not look as if invasion is nearly as imminent as the West has been uh, making it out. And as I say, um, the withdrawal of our diplomats, and by the way, our OSCE observers from eastern Ukraine, uh, damages Ukraine, damages the Ukrainian economy, confidence in Ukraine. Uh, in in a way that you know, in many ways matches what what Russia has been doing, but it also, I must say, really, really contradicts the idea that we are truly, in any genuine way, committed to support Ukraine. And, and Chris. Well, I'm not sure that I've got any specific insight into whether President Putin plans to invade or not, nor do I think anyone uh, participating in this discussion today can read his mind. W what we know is what the satellite photos tell us, which is that Russia's got over 100,000 forces on the border, the largest fighting force Russia has assembled uh, in the 30 years of independent Russia, the largest fighting force in the European continent, um, arguably uh, since uh, even since the Cold War ended as well. Um, what Putin plans to do with this, we simply don't know. We'll have to wait and see. But the thesis that this isn't a threat to Ukraine, I think, is implausible. There are only really two reasons you'd uh, plan to build up such an invasion force. One is to use it. The other is to threaten to use it and extract concessions. Either way, it's something we shouldn't accept. The idea that you can march your army to your neighbor's border in Europe and demand that they make fundamental concessions on their sovereignty, I don't think is a principle that anyone in Europe um, should accept. Certainly, it's not a principle that the United States is prepared um, to accept. Um, now, 
Anatol asks, what are we willing to do about it? He's right. The Ukraine is not in NATO. Uh, the Ukrainians know they're not uh, in NATO. Uh, and there's uh, no sense in Western states that the West should stand by Ukraine militarily in terms of fighting for the Ukrainians. But I think it's uh, it, it misreads reality to say that the West hasn't supported Ukraine substantially. $40 billion in economic aid via the IMF package since uh, since uh, 2014, uh, a series of military aid measures, diplomatic support for the Ukrainian government. This has made a real difference uh, to Ukraine. Is it enough? I think it's hard to say. We'll have to wait and see uh, how Russia and Ukraine responds. But the idea that simply because Russia marches its army to the Ukrainian border, it's time to throw the Ukrainians under the bus, I just don't buy that argument. And I think it's that's a very dangerous precedent for where Russia's army is going to march to next. And Chris, do you think that uh, more uh, military capabilities should be sent to Ukraine, you know, more lethal weapons from countries such, a, such as America and Britain? I do. I think the, 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 the risk right now is that Russia concludes it would be easy to pressure Ukraine milita militarily to move uh, its military into Ukraine. Uh, and anything we can do to raise the cost to Russia by threatening and imposing tough economic sanctions, by isolating Russia from international institutions, but also by strengthening the Ukrainian military is going to be better for Ukrainian sovereignty and make it less likely that Russia moves in. And, and Anatole, just on that, do you think there's a risk that uh, countries such as the US and, and, and Britain and, and other European allies could be dragged into this conflict uh, to an extent that it could, could, be, could, could have repercussions for people at home? Well, the repercussions will be, of course, uh, in terms of the you know, economic sanctions imposed on Russia uh, and Russia's reactions, which risk, uh, of course, much higher energy prices, but also um, because of the effects of, on Russia's commodity sales, uh, potentially much higher inflation around the world, including in Europe, with extremely destabilizing effects. So that, I think, will be the, uh, the, the direct effect if, you know, if God forbid this happens, I obviously hope very much that it won't. Yeah. Uh, just a reminder uh, to the audience of how to submit those questions. You type the question in the box at the bottom of your screen. If you don't want your name mentioned, click the anonymous button uh, before you press send. And I think we do have our uh, question from the audience. So I will just go into that one. So the first one. Given that Russia's main objective is to install a compliant government in Kiev, as he has in Minsk, surely his strategy of threatening Ukraine so aggressively is counterproductive, even an own goal. He has united Ukrainians against him. Thus he, must, thus, he must either invade and impose a puppet government, which would, be which would be bloody, to Russia as to Ukraine, or compromise. So the West's bargaining position is not as weak as some say, is the first point. Does anyone want to come back on that? Well, the notion that Putin or Russia want to install a new government in Kiev uh, is, I have to say, uh, on the face of it, entirely a product of the Western imagination. Uh, this, is not, this has not been stated by anyone in, uh, in the Russian government, certainly not by Putin. I mean, what they want to do is change certain aspects of Ukrainian policy. Um, which they regard as threatening to Russian security. Now, I have to say, from that point of view, the line that uh, Russia's attitude here uh, is either dishonest or paranoid is, to put it frankly, somewhat hilarious um, coming from uh, a member of the American establishment, and if I may say so, the American Enterprise Institute, which has, of course, repeatedly talked up to the greatest extent possible the alleged threat uh, to America from Iran, you know, a country with a, a tiny fraction of America's power, North Korea, Venezuela. I mean, please, if these are threats to the United States, the notion that Russia is paranoid or dishonest in suggesting that NATO's expansion to its borders uh, is a threat to Russia uh, really does argue something which approaches complete cognitive dissonance. Uh, I could perhaps refer to a, um, an article in the Wall Street Journal uh, a newspaper for which members of the AEI have frequently written uh, the other day, uh, saying that the uh, possibility of a Chinese naval base in Equatorial Guinea was a serious threat, a dire threat to American security, because this established 
a Chinese presence, yes, in America's backyard. Equatorial Guinea, by the way, is about 6,500 miles from the shores of America. So let us, uh, I think, just accept uh, that uh, great military powers are anxious uh, about hostile alliances approaching their borders. And it is perfectly natural in international terms that Russia should be anxious about this. Chris? Well, I, I don't know if I want to uh, jump into the affairs of Equatorial Guinea or Venezuela, which seem uh, rather distant from the questions of, of Russia and Ukraine. But I, I do want to push back on Anatole's suggestion that Russia simply wants to change Ukraine's, quote, policy, because in fact, when you look at the demands Russia is making, it's far greater than that. Russia wants to change Ukraine's constitution and the entire structure of Ukrainian politics. If you listen to what Russian leaders have asked for repeatedly since 2014 and 2015, the, what Russia means when it says it wants uh, autonomy for the Donbass in Ukraine is a Trojan horse by which Russia gets to create a state within a state, put its proxies in place, and exercise a veto over... Ukraine's domestic politics and its foreign policy institution. This is the plan. Uh, this is why uh, Russia seeks these changes in the Donbass. And so I don't think it's fair to say this is a policy change. This is a desire to control uh, the Ukrainian state. A, this is a legal guarantee that Russia seeks, uh, that it will be able to influence events uh, in Kiev. And that's why I think you see Ukrainian, um, the Ukrainian public be so against any sort of compromise in these questions. Russia is not looking for compromise on questions of policy, on debates over defense issues, on placements of Ukrainian soldiers. Russia wants a veto over Ukrainian nationhood. As Putin has said last summer in a very highly profile, high profile article, true sovereignty is only possible in partnership with Russia. And Russia wants to make this quote unquote partnership uh, a obligatory part of Ukrainian politics. And I think it's understandable why Ukrainians might not want to be that close of partners with Russia, knowing everything that that entails. Can I reply to that? Of course. Because uh, I've, I've uh, traveled in the Donbass previously and um, I've also written a, a paper on this subject. Uh, Autonomy for the Donbass is the official position of the United States, which endorsed the Minsk II agreement of 2015 and has never withdrawn that endorsement. Uh, autonomy as a solution to what is, uh, in effect, a form of ethnic conflict uh, is a perfectly normal and democratic solution to conflicts of this kind, uh, as, by the way, uh, is federalism as a political system for a state. Uh, there is no reason at all why the West should reject this in principle. Uh, but also, as far as um, the Ukrainians are concerned, I would agree entirely that there has been a shift in Ukrainian public opinion since 2014 as a result of Russian actions. But let us not forget that still a very large minority of Ukrainians, and remember that 20% or so of the, Russian, uh, the Ukrainian population considers itself to be ethnic Russian, uh, continue to want friendly relations with with Russia, uh, and are, by the way, deeply hostile uh, to the measures of ethnic Ukrainianization and the ethnic definition of Ukrainian nationalism, which has been coming out of Kiev, particularly over the past year. Uh, so um, the only solution to the Donbass uh, conflict is, in fact, one based on autonomy. There is no other. Um, the only alternative is for Ukraine to reconquer the place, which is, of course, frankly, exactly what hardliners in Moscow are praying that they do. So if you actually want to end this conflict and improve Ukrainian uh, security, then I'm afraid that the deal brokered by France and Germany, the Minsk II agreement, uh, and endorsed by the United States and the United Nations is the only way to go. Um, that is, you know, not the position of Putin. That is also the position of the West. That's right. But there's a crucial nuance in the Minsk II deal, which has prevented it from being implemented thus far, and that's the order of operations. Russia wants to hold elections in the territory it controls to put its proxies in charge, then send those proxies to the central government uh, as, as, as I said, a Russian Trojan horse in Kiev. Ukraine argues you, the opposite, which is which is no, Ukraine, Ukraine argues the opposite. Ukraine argues. Uh, please let me finish, Antal. Ukraine argues the opposite, which is that first you establish security. You have Ukrainian security personnel potentially with international monitors controlling the Russian-Ukrainian border. Elections take place under Ukrainian law, and then in a free and fair election, which could be supervised by the European Union or the United Nations, then you have autonomy in place. So the question is not autonomy, yes or no. It's does autonomy mean people that are handpicked by the militias that Russia has armed, backed, funded, set up? Or does it mean a free and fair election that international observers would approve? That's the key question. Anatole? 
No, uh, I'm sorry, but <laughs> this is not quite accurate. Uh, the point is that the Ukrainian government and parliament uh, have to pass a law guaranteeing permanent autonomy. Now, of course, that does not kick in, and you can have a provision to that effect, uh, until you have demilitarization, the withdrawal of Russian-backed forces, and so on. But without a cast-iron commitment to long-term autonomy, uh, clearly there can be no agreement. No um, peace settlement process uh, could possibly uh, agree uh, that the key provision would only kick in at the discretion of the Ukrainian state after they have re-established control. Simply a diplomatic non-starter. Well, it seems implausible to ask the Ukrainians to pass legislation uh, guaranteeing autonomy so long as the Russia-Ukraine border is controlled not by Ukraine, but by a bunch of Russia-backed militias. I understand why Ukraine wouldn't want autonomy when it's the Russian security services who control who enters and who leaves the territory where there's ostensibly going to be elections. This is about who gets to vote in those elections. Is it Russian security services personnel or Ukrainian citizens? Well, Ukraine has one definition and Russia has a very different, different answer to that question. Last As I've said, Anton? there can be a provision that it doesn't kick in until demilitarization and the withdrawal of these forces has occurred. But the point is, you have to have a guarantee of permanent autonomy. Without that, there can be no peace settlement. Okay, let's 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 go on to the uh, next question now. We've got a message uh, here. What message would allowing Russia to take over Ukraine send to China? That's that's an interesting one. Who wants to start us off with that one? Chris? Well, first of all, oh, go, on, Anton. Go, go ahead. Anton. Well, I'll just say no, nobody, no, nobody's talking about allowing Russia to take over Ukraine in the sense of occupying Ukraine militarily, um, you know, annexing the whole of Ukraine. That, that, that is not going to happen. We are, we are talking once again about aspects of Ukrainian and Western policy. And by the way, as I've said, we're talking about a compromise here. Any compromise has to involve the withdrawal of the Russian forces the additional Russian forces, which have been deployed on Ukraine's border. Uh, but as far as China is concerned, look, by far, and I mean by far the greatest asset to Chinese policy uh, is a, a crisis in Europe, the deployment of large numbers of additional American troops to Europe, the distraction of American attention, and a, a deepening hostility between Russia and the West, which drives Russia into increased dependence on China. This is what Beijing wants. Well, I guess I, I, on the question of China, I think it's clear that this would send a bad message to China if we let Russia overrun Ukraine. But I think I want to push back on Antol, who said that the question is um, not of letting Russia control Ukraine, because that's exactly what's at stake. When Russia talks about implementing Minsk on its definition, Russia wants to bring Ukraine back into its sphere of control, which is why the demands that Russia made have now expanded. They're not simply that Ukraine never joined NATO. It's also that NATO forces stop training Ukrainian forces. It's to degrade the defensive capabilities of the Ukrainian state. Now, why would you want to degrade the defensive capabilities of your neighbor? Are the Russians afraid that Ukraine's going to invade Russia? This seems implausible. Russia wants a weaker Ukraine so that it can more easily threaten and abuse Ukraine in the future. And you ask, well, is it conceivable that Russia could threaten and abuse Ukraine? Well, it's hard to imagine a more abusive relationship than what we've seen Russia do to Ukraine over the past decade. What Russia wants is a guarantee it can do this repeatedly in the future. Ideally, Ukraine is weakened so much that Russia doesn't even have to try hard to threaten Ukraine. Ukraine just falls into line. So I, I reject the notion that what's at stake isn't Ukrainian sovereignty. The reason Putin keeps talking about Ukrainian sovereignty is because what he's focused on is degrading Ukrainian sovereignty, turning Ukraine into a second tier state that has to answer uh, to the Kremlin's whims. Uh, and, and Chris, do you think any weakness uh, on the European part could embolden uh, China to take Taiwan? I think I think there is that risk, but to be honest, I think just as Anatole tried to tie this into Equatorial Guinea, I think there's plenty at stake in Europe rather than bringing this to the qu questions further afield. Um, whether or not Xi Jinping is looking closely at this, there's a lot at stake for European security. There's potential massive refugee flows. There's economic consequences. Europe's got a lot of reason just for European purposes to uh, stop Russia from moving into Ukraine and to stop Russia from repeatedly doing this 
again and again in the future. Don't forget, this is now uh, the third major Russia-Ukraine crisis we've faced uh, in the past uh, 15 or so years. And there's no reason to expect there won't be future Russia-Ukraine crises unless we're able to stabilize uh, Ukraine and give it the defenses it needs to stand up to Russia. Okay. Uh, Tolan, any, any further come back to that? Well, just to say once again uh, that by the standards of the United States, clearly, the American policies towards its neighbours, Russia has legitimate interests in Ukraine. It has not always pursued those interests legitimately, I would entirely agree, but then nor has the United States. Uh, we live in the world we have. We aspire to a system of international law. But once again, states will, to the extent of their ability, guarantee their own regional security, which is what Russia is doing uh, in the case of Ukraine. And we are not in a position to beat them at this game. We are, by the way, um, in a position to try to help Ukraine develop economically, develop its democracy, crack down on corruption, all these things we can and should do. I'm not arguing against that for a single second, uh, nor, of course, does this uh, form any part of Russia's uh, at least explicit demands. But I have to say on that score, um, two things. One is uh, that Chris has continually talked about NATO as the guarantor of successful change uh, in Eastern Europe after the end of the Cold War. By far the most important institution was, in fact, the European <laughs> Union, of course, in terms of economic reform, democratization, all these things. Uh, European Union membership for Ukraine remains, of course, open. But the problem here is, of course, that uh, Ukraine internally remains a highly dysfunctional, highly corrupt state uh, with um, a very divided political elite. But also uh, the expansion of the West, NATO, the European Union, to the former communist states of Eastern Europe, if I may say so, today no longer looks quite the unequivocal success story that it did a decade or so ago. If you look at the governments of Poland and Hungary, in many ways these are ideologically closer to the Putin regime than they are to the idealized model of Western liberal democracy. Other East European countries, of course, have so far failed very badly indeed to deal with their own extremely high levels of corruption and government criminality. So the point is that the expansion of the West as a whole is looking a much more problematical uh, case uh, than it did 10 or 15 years ago. Okay, just, just, a, just a reminder uh, to, that you can tweet using the hashtag IQ2. Next question, should the Ukrainians just accept their unfortunate geography? The West will never defend them from absorption into the Russian orbit. OK, Chris, you start us off with that one. Well, I don't think so. You can point to a lot of countries in Europe that have unfortunate geographies and long histories of being abused by Russia, uh, from Poland to the Baltic states to Finland, that have taken meaningful steps to defend themselves. And I don't think it's at all uh, crazy to say that Ukraine ought to do the same, um, especially given that a majority of its populace wants to. And I think this isn't simply about sort of abstract principles of sovereignty or territorial integrity. Anatol mentioned development, anti-corruption efforts. Is this going to be easier or harder to do uh, if Russia is breathing down your throat? One of the greatest challenges Ukraine has faced is that Russia is constantly meddling in its politics, funding, supporting different oligarchic groups, using corruption as a tool uh, to win support in the uh, Ukrainian parliament, buying uh, uh, television channels in Ukraine and, uh, and, and, and using them to degrade the media environment. Ukraine has plenty of domestic internal issues that it needs to deal with on its own, but Russia's exacerbated all of these problems. And everything we know about Russian governance at home uh, is also exported abroad. And Ukraine's been, I think, the number one victim of Russia uh, using these tools of misgovernance as a way to increase Russian influence in the country. So when I ask myself, if I were Ukraine, what kind of future would I want? I'd want a future that was closer to Europe, the European mainstream. And uh, everything we know about how Russia exercises power at home and abroad points in the exact opposite direction of what I would want. Anton? In the immortal words of a pro-American dictator of Mexico, poor Mexico, so far from God, and so close to the United States. 
geography does matter. Um, countries, unfortunately, and it is, I agree, unfortunate, do have to adapt themselves to the interests of much more powerful neighbours. That is how the world works. That is certainly how the United States works with regard uh, to its neighbours. There is indeed a, a little country which has defied the United States in its immediate neighbourhood. It's called Cuba, um, and America has punished it um, ever since uh, with sanctions um, for the past, God, 60 years now, since I was born. Uh, so let us once again not pretend that this is something unique to Russia or uniquely evil uh, about Russia. Uh, as far as uh, Ukraine getting um, close to the West is concerned, uh, I would say that um, Russia has certainly had allies in promoting Ukrainian corruption. That includes a Wall Street, uh, who have um, contributed greatly to the shipping of the proceeds of stolen Ukrainian and, of course, Russian money from these countries to Western bank accounts, bank accounts in the Cayman Islands, luxury property in London. Uh, as I think we know from the examples of Romania and Bulgaria, uh, issues of corruption, government dysfunction are not simply a, a result of Russian influence, because Russian influence in these countries is now minimal. Uh, they are, unfortunately, uh, the product uh, of deeply rooted inherited uh, political systems and political culture, uh, which, once again, as we have seen, cannot simply be abolished by waving a wand, uh, removing Russian influence and moving these countries into the orbit of the, of the West. Um, Mexico has been in the American orbit for, what, 200 years now? No, 150 anyway. It doesn't seem to have done much for Mexico. Chris? Well, let, let's zoom in, if we can, on a couple of other countries that also have unfortunate geography and were formerly part of the Russian Empire in the Baltic states. So Latvia, Lithuania, Estonia are closer to St. Petersburg than Kiev is to Moscow. Uh, and yet these countries have been very clearly defended from uh, Russia over the past couple of years, precisely because they joined NATO. But it's not actually no, just their defense. Because, because an Estonian is an Estonian and not a Romanian. Um, okay, I think because they joined NATO, but I guess, we could, I guess we could debate that. But if you look, for example, at Latvian politics in the 1990s and early 2000s, what you'll find is a country that then was dominated by a bunch of oligarchs, the people who controlled, for example, the oil pipelines that crossed um, Latvia and reached the shores of the Baltic Sea. The mayor of Ventspils, for example, one of the largest uh, cities in the country, was by all definitions an oligarch. But over the process of these countries, integration with the EU, anti-corruption anti programs, free elections, where people were able to vote out bad politicians. They've slowly uh, uh, removed the oligarchs from their politics. N none of these countries are perfect, but by any definition, their politics are less corrupt, incomes are higher, the populace lives better than they did 30 years ago. Former Soviet states right on the border of Russia with all with large ethnic Russian and Russian speaking populations, they're not suffering from some sort of inherited genetic cultural um, factors that Angel suggested uh, the Ukrainians suffer from. And I think there's no reason to think that if Ukraine were given a generation of development without being uh, harassed by the Russians, without facing constant invasion, able to integrate with Ukraine's neighbors in Central Europe, Ukraine would end up being a very different country as well, just like the Baltic states have ha has happened to the Baltic states, just like has happened with Poland, just like has happened with most of Central Europe. It's unrecognizable compared to where it was uh, 30 years ago when the Cold War ended, thanks to NATO, thanks to the AU EU, thanks to the fact that they weren't constantly being pressured by Russia uh, and mil with military means. But I think you could put it a different way, which is uh, if a country is not going to succeed uh, in successful democratization and economic reform without being a member of the European Union and NATO, then it's unlikely to succeed if it is a member of the European Union and NATO. And reference has often been made here to the, exa uh, the example of Finland uh, and Austria during the Cold War, which, of course, by treaty could not join one. Finland still, could not join NATO and the European Union, but of course developed as tremendously successful free market democracies. And once again, uh, I am certainly not arguing against Western assistance, economic treaties with Ukraine, everything possible to help Ukraine develop in that, in that direction, by all means. But in the end, it comes down to the Ukrainians themselves. Okay, let's, let's move on to the next question. How likely do you think war is and what do you think that will look like on the ground? So, for example, an attempted coup, incursion into eastern Ukraine, an attack on Kiev or a full scale invasion? 
at all? Do you want to kick us off with that one? Well, first of all, uh, as I say, um, I, I hope uh, war will not happen, and I'm not convinced uh, that it it will. Uh, I now the, the thing about war is, of course, that it has a an unhappy. Um, unfortunate from the expert point of view, uh, when war does occur, uh, or very often uh, contradicting everything that experts have said in advance about what was going to happen. You know, uh, wars develop their own dynamic. They turn out quite differently from what people predicted. Uh, my, my own sense is that um, if that before, you know, we, we move to full scale war, uh, there will be, or there could be, I'm not saying this will happen, um, a series of escalations, clashes uh, in the Donbass, for example, um, which uh, Russia will use to send messages to the West about Russia's seriousness to strengthen Russia's position in these negotiations. Uh, Do you mean a false flag operation or an actual uh, event? An, possibly an actual event. I, I, I don't know from that point of view. Uh, but I think um, it will be very important in these circumstances to keep our nerve, um, you, you know, to continue to negotiate, not to overreact, um, and to seek a reasonable compromise. Now, of course, if Russia launches a full-scale invasion, uh, my own sense is that even then the intention will be uh, to negotiate, to, to use this as a basis for negotiations. In other words, uh, to um, negotiate once again uh, the non-expansion of NATO, uh, federalism for, for for Ukraine, but obviously from a stronger military position. But look, I, I, I wouldn't put any um, any money on that. We just don't know, to be honest. Chris? Well, I think Anatole's right that it's very hard to have any great confidence as to what steps Russia will do next. There are this vast menu of options that uh, the Russian leadership could accept uh, or could choose to to enact. But I, I think what this points to is that uh, there's no benefit on our side of saying we're going to close the door to Ukraine now. We're going to negotiate over Ukraine's head now. That just throws the Ukrainians under the bus before the fighting has even started. I, I hope the fighting doesn't start. I think the Ukrainians have a right to defend themselves if they choose to. And the fact of the matter is that most Ukrainian politicians and most Ukrainian populace says they want to defend their sovereignty. So for us to go over their heads and say, we're not going to give them the chance to become a normal European country, uh, seems to me to be very, not only irresponsible, but simply unfair to the Ukrainians. Uh, question... Finland is a perfectly normal European country without being a member of NATO. Finland fought Russia numerous times for the right to become a normal European no, country. No, it didn't. It fought them twice, once in alliance with the Nazis. Okay, yeah, fought Russia numerous times to become a normal European country. Tw twice. <laughs> More Chris, than once, okay. Uh, Chris, question just for you. What, what is the alternative to compromise and what would be the consequences? Well, I, I think, as I said at the outset, compromise is an excellent idea. And I think we should pursue the compromise that has been proposed by Western leaders, which is to say that there's deals to be done on uh, on intermediate range missiles in Europe. There are deals to be done on strategic stability talks, on cybersecurity, on rules governing military exercises. All of these are spheres where there's plenty of room for conversation and where conversation has already started. I think that's where the compromise ought to happen. I think there's scope as well for compromise in the Donbass, but it's gotta be a compromise that takes Ukraine's interests seriously. If compromise simply means ignoring the Ukrainians, letting the Russians run over them in negotiations, uh, that doesn't seem like a compromise we should embrace. So the specifics of the compromise matter. And I don't think we should do a compromise that leaves Ukraine on the cutting table. Um, instead, we should compromise with the Ukrainians at our side, saying let's do a deal with Russia from a position of strength that accomplishes the goals we want. And I think Ukraine's sovereignty and territorial integrity are something that we should embrace as goals uh, and say to Russia, we're willing to stand up to these. Another but we question. are not and cannot negotiate from a position of military strength because, once again, we have made it absolutely clear that we are not going to defend Ukraine. And what is more, as I pointed out, we do not have the forces in Europe to defend Ukraine. Uh, America has four brigades. Um, you would need Cold War-style deployments. Nobody, by the way, in the Pentagon is thinking of that, uh, nor, of course, is anyone uh, serious in any NATO country, uh, given what this would mean. 
So well, if we, Anatole are, is... you, we are not in a position to negotiate uh, from a position of strength. If Anatole is right about American military weakness in Europe, then it further undermines the argument that the Kremlin ought to be fearful of our, our impressive military strength. But I think we do have levers that Anatole underestimates. One is the threat of economic sanctions on Russia, which I think could be quite powerful. And I've been impressed uh, personally by the sanctions that U.S. and EU and U.K. leaders have all signaled might come. I think that's a meaningful step. I think aiding the Ukrainians in their effort to defend themselves uh, is a meaningful step. It makes it less likely uh, that Russia chooses to escalate militarily, increasing the cost on Russia. Uh, to pretend that we've got no tools and are powerless seems to me wildly inaccurate. The, the U.S., U.K., and EU combined have 20 times the economy of Russia. And so the thesis that we should pretend we're powerless uh, doesn't, to me, make sense. Uh, now, if Anatole's right and we don't have the military power we need, perhaps we ought to uh, remedy that. But I think Anatole's statement that we're military, weak, we're hopeless, and also Russia has plenty of reason to be fearful of our power, uh, something in that doesn't add up to me. I, I would entirely agree that the, the threat of economic sanctions uh, is a serious deterrent to, to, to Russian invasion. Absolutely. But what I've said repeatedly is that uh, the keeping the door open to Ukrainian membership of NATO uh, is ridiculous because uh, we have made clear that we are not going to defend Ukraine and cannot, in fact, do so. So there ought to be, in a rational world, which I know is not the world we live in, but a rational world of, of Western policy, uh, there is no reason whatsoever uh, to seek a compromise with Russia on the question of NATO membership, which is, after all, one of Russia's principal demands. OK, uh, we've got time for a couple more questions. Do the Russian proposals for negotiations offer the US the opportunity to pursue a realist strategy and secure stability in Europe at the slight expense of more say in European affairs for Moscow, so as to better pursue an Asian Pacific strategy? Uh, and I tell you, you're nodding your head there. Do you want to go straight in? Yes. Well, I mean, look, first of all, speaking from a realist point of view, uh, the expansion of NATO and the European Union and the way it was also conceived and phrased has been an attempt to expel Russia quite explicitly from Europe uh, and from European cons uh, security considerations. Now, that is not going to work. Uh, Russia is simply too powerful and is also too deeply invested in some of its neighbours for that to be a possibility. So, yes, um, there has to be uh, an, an attempt, which, by the way, these treaties of which we've been speaking uh, did um, uh, incorporate to some extent to bring Russia back into a European security architecture. Uh, now, for, from that point of view, um, though, uh, we have to remember that uh, in many ways the disintegration of um, this system of treaties uh, was initiated by the United States with the withdrawal from the um, anti-ballistic missile. Uh, treaty. Uh, the, um, the West also refused, for a variety of reasons, some of them good, some of them bad, uh, to go ahead with the Conventional Forces in Europe agreement. So the point is that, uh, yes, um, these treaties uh, are good for European security, uh, but they will require compromises and concessions on our side as well, as every arms control process. Uh, has required. Uh, and if we can achieve this, then yes, this will strengthen America's ability to meet challenges elsewhere in the world, of which, of course, as every American administration since Obama has said, China is by far the greatest. From a realist point of view, and great American realis realists like John Mearsheimer have pointed this out, it is crazy to devote so much attention to Russia. Uh, which is, a, at best, a second-order threat uh, to the West and actually poses no direct threat to the United States whatsoever, uh, and in the process to neglect China, which is indeed already a peer competitor of the United States in a way that Russia will never be again. Chris? Well, it seems to me that the U.S. and its friends have an, enough of an attention span to deal with both uh, European issues and Asian issues at the same time. So I, I worry less uh, that we're not going to have the resources that we need to address both Russia and China uh, simultaneously, especially because, as Anatole mentioned, the, neither the U.S. nor NATO will get involved militarily uh, in the question of Russia and Ukraine. So this is simply an economic, a diplomatic question for us rather than a, 
a military question. But I wanted to return to Anatole's question about uh, the idea of ejecting Russia from Europe as a bad idea and, and ask, 30 years ago, there were Russian troops in Berlin and Prague and Budapest. Was that a, was that a good thing? Uh, or was it a success for the West that we ejected Russia from European security? I, for one, wouldn't feel safer if the Russian forces were still there. And I think the further we can go in terms of ejecting the Russians from European security, the better. That doesn't mean we should make Russia less secure, but Russia's got over a thousand nuclear warheads and plenty of delivery systems. And no one in Russia thinks that NATO is going to launch an invasion of Russian territory uh, from Estonia. But the idea that removing Russia from Europe was a bad idea, I think, uh, fits poorly with the historical facts. And I think you'd struggle to find very many people in Berlin or Prague or Budapest who would wish the Russians would return. I am certainly not arguing that the Russians should return uh, to Central and Eastern Europe. Uh, and also, of course, we did not eject uh, Russia from there. This was the Soviet Union, the communist state, um, dominating these areas in the, in the name of communism, uh, and withdrew from these areas um, when communism disappeared. Uh, by the way, I should point out that the first government uh, to recognize the independence of the Baltic states was, in fact, the Russian government uh, of Yeltsin. So there is no uh, prospect of Russia returning to control over the Soviet bloc. You talked about, you know, restoration of Russian empire in, uh, in Eastern Europe. A, Russia has never had that empire. Russia as opposed to the Soviet Union. B, nobody in, in Moscow is dreaming of that. The point is that as you approach Russian border, Russia's borders, as you take in countries with huge Russian minorities, with deep strategic importance for Russia, with huge cultural and economic importance for Russia, so inevitably you threaten vital Russian interests in a way that Hungarian or Polish membership of NATO and the European Union did not. And if you threaten a country's vital interests, that country will push back. And that is absolutely as true of the United States as it is of Russia or China or India or anywhere else. Um, this is simply a fact of international politics. OK, we'll leave that there. To me is just one final comment, Lucy. It seems to me is that all, yep. all we're asking for is for Russia to remove its troops from Crimea, remove its troops from the Donbass. If it could remove its troops from Moldova and Georgia, that would be nice too, and go back to its own territory unless other countries invite them in. That doesn't seem to be that uh, wild of an ask, especially in contemporary Europe, and yet that's what Russia repeatedly refuses to do. Tell, uh, t tell the Armenian population of America that Russia should withdraw its troops from Nagorno-Karabakh and hand the population there back to Azerbaijan and see what answer you get. Uh, ask the Abkhaz and the southern Ossetes, uh, who, of course, passionately uh, asked for a Russian military presence to defend them from the Georgians. Uh, these are all civil wars uh, in which there are populations ranged on opposing sides. Yes, Russia has taken one side. Uh, in these wars. So have we on so many occasions uh, in the past in conflicts of this kind. Uh, there are no saints in this conversation. Okay, let's, let's leave that there. You've now got up to two minutes each just to sum up your final points. So Chris, would you like to go first? Sure. Well, perhaps I can pick up on the question of civil wars, which Anatole left off on it. If you listen to Russia, what you'll find is a story of the Russia-Ukraine conflict being a civil war. And if you buy the thesis that Putin has put forward that Russians and Ukrainians are fraternal peoples or maybe even the same people, it depends on which day you ask him, you might think that this is an internal question of Russia, Russian politics. But the fact of the matter is that opinion poll after opinion poll, election after election in Ukraine shows that Ukraine wants to be an independent country. Uh, civil war simply doesn't apply. The militias that were set up in eastern Ukraine uh, were set up by members of the Russian security services. We know their names. They've been reported on in Russian media. This is not a civil conflict. This is an interstate conflict where Russia is trying to control its neighbors. And so I think drawing comparisons to Armenia and Azerbaijan missed the point. Ukraine wants to be independent uh, and Russia doesn't want to let it become independent. That's the core issue uh, at stake here. It's not Russian security. It's not whether NATO is going to attack Russia. It's not uh, Equatorial Guinea or Venezuela. It's should Ukraine uh, be independent and be allowed to assert its independence against Russian threats. And so I think we should certainly offer to compromise with Russia, cut deals over missile placements and where NATO troops go and where Russian troops go. That's all fine. But I don't think we should do it 
over Ukraine, against Ukraine, in a way that undercuts Ukrainian sovereignty. Ukraine is a nation that deserves to be able to defend itself, and we shouldn't take steps that undermine Ukrainian security. Instead, we should support them, because there is no reason, despite Anatole's claims that Ukrainians are inveterately corrupt or uh, hopelessly unable to set up an effective government, there's no reason why, if Ukraine were left alone by the Russians, not attacked on a regular basis as they have over the past seven or eight years, that Ukraine couldn't become a normal Central European country. Country, just like Poland, just like uh, uh, just like um, the Czech Republic, just like the Baltic states, all of which are vastly transformed from a couple decades ago, thanks to NATO, thanks to the European Union, thanks to integration with the West in general. That doesn't seem like a crazy Same fate for Ukraine, and I don't think we should undermine it now by throwing the Ukrainians under the bus. Okay, thanks, Anatol. Mm -hmm. uh, well, first, I, I really think we have to get away from this ridiculous phrase, a normal European country. Um, you know, we also have Romania, Bulgaria, Turkey, for that matter, is a European country. There are many different kinds of European country. Uh, France may elect, uh, you know, what a few years ago would have been regarded as a, as a fascistic government soon. Uh, so this uh, Fukuyamaite idea that membership of NATO and the European Union represents the end of history, uh, you know, that is an intellectual idea that has really passed its sell-by date. Um, Ukraine will remain where it is. You know, whether and, and will have to respond to Russia's interests. Uh, there are different versions of Ukrainian identity. And as far as opinion polls are concerned, well, in Crimea and the Donbass before 2014, you saw huge majorities of the local population opposed to Ukrainian ethnic nationalism and calling strongly for friendship and close relations with Russia. So yes, this is a civil conflict uh, in, in Ukraine. It is not simply a matter uh, of Russian um, you know, uh, creating these areas. It is Russia supporting the will of large parts of the local population. For this, we have to seek a negotiated compromise in the Donbass. Uh, and uh, finally, well, as on half, at least half of the debate, my esteemed opponent has agreed with me. We need compromise with Russia uh, on arms control. I couldn't agree more. So thank you, you've, you've agreed with my position. On Ukrainian NATO membership, I simply have to repeat again, um, by the standards of the United States itself, as repeatedly demonstrated uh, under the name of the Monroe Doctrine, America is terrified of hostile alliances approaching its borders. Russia is no different. Both countries have pursued illegitimate policies in response to this, but that does not make Russia uniquely evil. And finally, to repeat once again, since we have demonstrated repeatedly that we cannot and will not defend Ukraine, the offer of future Ukrainian membership of NATO on our part is an irresponsible lie. Thank you. Excellent. Thank, thank you both. A uh, great point to end on. Uh, right. So it is time for you, the audience, to make your final vote on the motion. The West should seek a compromise with Russia over Ukraine. So please vote for or against the motion. And if you still haven't made up your mind, then, of course, vote undecided. While we're just waiting for those results to come in, I will just... Uh, ask another question from the audience. Uh, both of you, you've still got the fight in you. Uh, should Germany shut Nord Stream 2 if Russia invades Ukraine? Give us your thoughts on that, Anatole. Yes, it should. Yeah. I, I, I believe firmly uh, in deterring a Russian invasion of Ukraine and in reacting strongly against one. That is not the subject of this motion. The motion is to try to prevent a war through reasonable compromise. Chris? I think we agree on this issue, so not much to debate. Yeah, OK. And one more. What are your thoughts on the possible cyber threat from Russia in response to the increased Western pressure? It seems like there is a threat. We've seen it for the past couple of years from Russia. Um, and the question is, uh, what does one do about it? Do you just accept that Russia is going to both fund its own cyber gangs, but also use state-backed cyber attacks, or do you try to deter it by uh, threatening consequences? It seems to me that the strategy of Western powers thus far, simply naming and shaming Russian cyber attacks, trying to call them out, hasn't worked in reducing them. Um, quite the contrary. I think we've seen the opposite trend. So it 
it does seem like we need to be more forthright in saying the more cyber attacks Russia launches and more cyber gangs Russia organizes and funds, the more consequences there will be. But as a matter of fact, the United States has been uh, forthright. There was an article in the New York Times a couple of years ago, uh, leaked you know, by American um, security, uh, that um, America has put itself in a position to launch cyber attacks, mass massive cyber attacks on Russian infrastructure if, America, if Russia uh, engages in cyber attacks, not espionage, that's quite different, but in actual sabotage, which Russia has not done to the United States. Um, so yes, I mean, we are in a position, or America is in a position to, to, to hit back and has said so, and the Russians know it. Um, right. But once again, yeah. uh, in the same way, right? Yeah, okay. We've got those results in. So from the first vote uh, where you voted at the beginning of the event, it was 43% for the motion, 23% against and 34% undecided. And now at the end, the final vote, we've got 57% for, 30% against and less of you undecided, 13% undecided. Brilliant. Thank you. Thank you, all of you. Thanks to Anatole Lievin, Chris Miller, and to our audience, and to Intelligence Squared.